as a species, we know that fitness is a big part of who and what we are. We talk a lot about mental fitness, we talk a lot about physical fitness, but we haven't really integrated a term necessarily for spiritual fitness and what exactly that means. Well, that's something that I want to try to deliver to you in some fashion or other today. Now, I've been doing this for the best part, as Emma said, of about 30 odd years. There is a, a wealth of information in that, but I think that the more you understand something, the better you can distill it. So don't feel that I'm trying to give you 30 years of training in 30 minutes. I'm not. On the contrary, what I'm doing is I'm taking what I believe to be the most relevant understanding of things and I'm going to deliver them to you in, I believe, a, a relatively uh, worthwhile package here for you. So we say that the world, the universe, is made of energy. Now, that is a term that I believe gets thrown around far too much. When people say that the world is made of energy, what exactly does that mean? Well, martial arts is the study of energy. Principally, what is exchanged between the proverbial two opponents is energy. And ultimately, as martial arts is the study of energy, by implication it is therefore the study of the universe because everything is energy. And so when I try to perhaps express to people what it is I am trying to achieve during this process, what I'm trying to show people is how to learn to use that energy. And we only understand how to use something if we fundamentally understand its principles. So that's what I want to outline today. So the rather dualistic view of the world is that it is made of various bits and pieces and that somehow these bits and pieces add up to the world that we see around us today. Now this model of reality so to speak leads to a rather common philosophical conundrum known as infinite regress which means that if the universe is an object, if it's a thing, then presumably something created that thing and something created that thing and something created that thing, and so on and so forth. And we refer to this as infinite regress. When we say the world is made of energy, we're referring to something quite different. Because energy is not a something, it is a process. We never actually see energy, we only see the effects of energy. So for example, we would say that there is energy in a river, because the river flows. We can talk about the water flowing, and we can talk about the energy behind the water that makes it flow. But we can't put our finger necessarily on the energy in the water, other than to say, if it's flowing down a mountain, then the gravity is pushing the water down. But in order to say that, we have to include the mountain, the river, the theory of gravity, and so on and so forth. But once more, we can't quite put our finger on what exactly is energy. Well, what we start with when we want to discuss anything is the proverbial first principles. And when I said to you that I want to avoid the possibility of infinite regress, I don't want to start with something. And therefore, I'm going to do something very daring, and I'm going to start with nothing. Okay? So I'm going to talk about how we get something from nothing. And it is this something from nothing principle that is behind everything that we experience in the universe. And this is the core understanding of what exactly energy is. It's the something from nothing principle. So if, for example, you were to stand in the middle of the room and you were to walk to the left, when you walk to the left, you already create right. Because if this was the center of the room and you walk to the left of the room, then needless to say, you've now created a point between where you, where you are and where you were. And from here to there is the right. Okay? So by walking from where you are, which is here, and walking over to somewhere else, which is there, you've now created there. But by walking over to there, there becomes here, and there switches places with here. So you understand what I'm saying. If you are to walk left, you create right. When you walk over here, you create there. So, in essence, everything you're doing is creating its opposite. 
Okay? Fundamentally, things are existing because of their opposite. So if, for example, we were to describe movement, we can't talk about movement without alluding to stillness, because stillness is ultimately what creates the perspective of movement. We can't have my hand moving without the stillness of the background. It's because the foreground that we have a background. It's because we have movement, we have stillness. So in principle, what we are saying is that for anything to exist as form, there must be its opposite. And the opposite to form is emptiness, or perhaps another term one might use is nothing, but that's a rather derogatory term. So we might say that if my hand is a certain form, then in order for that to be precipitated into existence, there must be something behind that that has no form. And what lies behind the form is what we refer to as the emptiness. Now, this is not to confuse people and say that in the beginning there was emptiness and then there was form. This is not, this is not how it works. What I'm saying is that form and emptiness are part of the same thing. They come into being at the same time. You simply can't have nothing existing because in order for nothing to exist, it must have the contrast of something in order to give it a definition. So what in essence I'm saying is that if we take time and this idea of in the beginning out of the picture, what we have is emptiness and form as the fundamental principles of everything that we experience. And what the form takes, and this is very important, the form that is precipitated from the emptiness cannot be one particular kind of form. Because Rory, was, can I just uh, inter interrupt you there? Mm -hmm. um, I think you, you, you went offline, actually. Um, oh. So if you can just back up for a, yeah. a few minutes. Now, just tell me where to exactly, if you can tell me where to pick up. Um, I'm not sure, but you, I, I didn't notice when you'd actually gone offline, but um, I think you're back on again now. Okay, yeah, that's no problems. Um, I, I'll just pick up that again. So what I'm just saying in principle is that when we take the view that the universe is, is an object, we have this notion that it is an object that has been precipitated from another object, which has been precipitated from another object, and so on and so forth. And this leads to infinite regress. So instead, okay. in modern... Is this okay? Yeah, I think so. Um, a, a modern term that we employ to describe the universe is that it is made of energy. Energy is not an object. Energy is a process. And what I mean by it being a process is that when, for example, we look at a river, we can talk about the energy of the river moving along. We can talk about the energy in the wind that moves the trees. We can talk about the energy that drives my laptop. But when I take my finger and try to put it on energy itself, we can never seem to find it. We can talk about the effects of energy. We can talk about how energy manifests. But we can't say what exactly is energy. So that's what I'm trying to describe to you is what is energy. And the way I express that to people is, I say, if you were to stand in the middle of the room and you were to walk to the left, when you walk to the left, you automatically create right. If you say I'm standing here and I'm going to walk over there, when you walk over there, you now create another here and therefore another there. So in essence, whenever you are doing anything, you are in effect creating the seed of its opposite. So this is the fundamental principle of the, the Taoist understanding of nature, that the world doesn't have a beginning. We don't talk about there being a beginning per se, because we talk about what we experience, what we see around us, as form. Form is my hands and the room and the universe as you see it. But what is the opposite to form is formless. Another word for formless is emptiness. Now, when I say the word emptiness, 
I don't mean that in some derogatory fashion to imply some benign nothingness. What in essence I'm saying is that you can't have form without something with which to precipitate the form. So for example, I couldn't talk about movement unless there was stillness in the background. You can only see my hand moving because there's something still in the background. You can only see that my shirt is black because my hands are white. You can only see my hand moving in the foreground because there's a background. So in essence, if for example, this common term that gets thrown around that the universe is made of light, one of these fluffy statements, if everything was made of light, then we couldn't actually see anything. It's because there's darkness, the light has something to reflect off. And likewise, this is the fundamental principle of everything that we see around us as being form. That form is only tangible to us, experienceable to us, because of what underlies that form. And what underlies that form is what we refer to as the emptiness. But this emptiness, as I said, is not to be uh, considered as a kind of a in the beginning there was emptiness and then there was form. Form and emptiness come into being at the same time. They create each other. You couldn't have left, we'll say, coming onto the stage of the universe and right coming on five minutes later. It wouldn't make any sense. Neither can you have the emptiness existing without the contrast of the form with which to create it. And neither can you have form existing without the emptiness to create the form. So when we talk about there being a beginning, there is no beginning. There simply is what is. And what is, is the emptiness and the form. And they are creating each other. The Forms that are precipitated from the emptiness are no form in particular. And this is very important. When the, and this is at all times, there is no past, there is no present, when the emptiness is precipitating form, the form that is taken cannot be one particular form. Because if it was to be one particular form, we'd be stuck with the same situation again. And thus, the forms that are precipitated from the emptiness like the emptiness, are also infinite. And therefore, the universe, in essence, is an infinite expression of form, which, of course, we are currently experiencing in our consciousness, and hence the fact that it's constantly changing. Now, the reason that it's constantly changing, the reason that the form is not taking one shape or another shape, is because of this simple principle that the emptiness is infinite. It is non-form. It has no particular shape or size or texture or anything to it, and therefore what it precipitates, likewise, must also be infinite in its expression. So when the emptiness expresses anything, in Taoist philosophy we call this the great polarity. The great polarity is also known as Tai Chi, and Tai Chi is represented by a symbol, which is the two fish, one on top of the other. The fish on top is usually the white fish with the black eye, and on the bottom is the black fish with the white eye. What you'll notice with these two fish, and I'll just call them fish, you can call them whatever you like, they're circling each other. And as they circle each other, what's being implied by the image is that they are dissolving into each other. Now, I'll explain exactly how this works. This works on the principle that you couldn't have, let's say, left existing without right. Wouldn't be possible. Because as I said, you only know left by knowing right. But you can still understand what left is. But you couldn't have something just being left forever. If the entire universe was just left, we'd have no idea what right means. So therefore, in order for left to exist, left must ultimately become right in order to create in order for left to exist, it must become right, because right creates left. So you can't have something being anything forever. In other words, everything, every form, is impermanent. And the reason it's impermanent is because it must always give way to its opposite. And when it reaches its opposite state, or its opposite polarity, as we often call it in Tai Chi, likewise, 
it only can be this state by virtue of its opposite state and eventually must give way once more to its opposite state. And likewise, the cycle goes back again. So whenever anything comes into existence, the Tai Chi symbol represents the fact that everything that comes into existence, every form that comes into existence has got the seed of its opposite and ultimately must become its opposite for a period, in which case ultimately that gives way to its opposite for a period. And this is why we have day becoming night, becoming day, becoming night, and so on and so forth. And this is also why we have the cycles of the, of the sun and everything else. So everything takes a kind of a cyclical fashion in nature. And this is one of the fundamental principles of energy. We're starting to get our teeth into energy a little bit right now. So what we are suggesting is that energy, therefore, is a process. Energy is not, as one might try to describe it as we normally would from our everyday experience of things, energy is not a thing. Energy is a process. So when we want to uh, perhaps understand and generate energy, we do so naturally by shifting from one polarity to another polarity. Yeah? By shifting from one polarity to its opposite polarity and back again, we're starting to flow with the natural cycle that we define is energy. And this is the principal motif of what I refer to as a spiritual workout. We're literally going to understand the polar principle of energy and we're going to start to swing with that. We're going to start to flow with that a little bit and we're going to try to understand a principle behind that that I refer to as the more for less principle. Now, I'm going to demonstrate that to you right now. Um, I'm going to show you much as I can do, a bit more exercise-oriented material tonight because I think I could talk all day about the uh, philosophical aspects and I don't think that's fair on people, frankly. Um, so let me go through some of the principal exercises and we can take it from there. Okay, I'm on a microphone here, so hopefully you should see me and hear me likewise. If anybody doesn't, please flag it. Otherwise, I'm going to demonstrate my uh, principle to you. So I'm going to stand here so you can see me fully. I'm going to hold my hand out like so. At this point, my hand is in what we refer to as stillness. Okay? My hand is also up, and my hand is to the right. Okay? But we know if I leave my hand there for long enough, it's going to get tired. And eventually, when it gets tired, it's going to drop. Now, notice what happened. I went from stillness to movement. I also went from up to down. And I also went from right to left. And because of the weight of my hand and because of the mechanics of my body, I'm also going to go from clockwise to eventually, and most of you have guessed this by now, to a point where I stop once more. Because the momentum of my hand automatically loses its energy to gravity and eventually my hand stops. And when it stops here, it gives way to its opposite once more like so. So watch this again. I go from top to bottom, left to right, and clockwise, which we'll see in a moment becomes anti-clockwise, and we also have stillness to movement. So watch this. Stillness to movement and back up to stillness, which is now left, and this becomes anti-clockwise, left to right, top to bottom, bottom to top, movements to stillness, and back again. Okay, so this is the crux of the spiritual workout. This is the crux of Tai Chi, and certainly I'm developing my own system, as Emma has alluded to, based on uh, tai Chi, lucid dreaming, the likes, and I'll be talking about that in future seminars and so forth. But for the moment, at least, I'm just going to show you the basic principle. The basic principle is the pendulum. Okay? Now, watch what happens with the pendulum. When we try to control the pendulum, like so, 
In other words, I take my hand and I perform the same movement, but I do so by using my muscles. It looks like this. I'm using muscular tension to create this movement. Okay, and up here. And I'm going to use muscular tension again, do the same thing. Okay, now what I've done there is I put a lot of input into this movement by using my own muscular energy. So I'm putting effort into creating that movement. Now let's watch when we allow the polarities to operate. So I hold my hand like so. Now I don't use muscular intention. I use my mind intention to allow the movement to happen naturally. I allow the polarities to just exchange naturally. And it looks more like this. And eventually, as you can see, it will come to a stop because movement eventually will lead to stillness. But of course, you know I won't leave my hand there forever. Eventually, I'll find a reason to move it again, in which case, that's what I'm doing right now. So, now let's watch something else. I'm going to bring a little bit of my mind intention into it, a little bit of my muscular input into it, and I'm going to allow the polarities to play as well. And watch what happens. Okay, strange thing right there. My hand is actually going a little bit higher on each swing. And the strange thing is, I'm putting in less input than I had to when I was moving the hand with pure muscular intention. So now what I'm doing, by putting a little bit of intention into it, and just allowing myself to follow the natural change of events, I'm putting in less effort for more output. Okay, this is the principle of everything that's happening in nature. The reason the universe is expanding is because of the less and more, or as I describe it, the more for less principle. In essence, because everything, every form, is naturally giving way to its opposite, it creates a kind of what we call an energy potential. So whatever's happening right now in your life, is automatically creating the next verse in this proverbial song. And in doing so, if you can feel what's going on right here, you can feel where the energy is going next. And instead of resisting it, instead of trying to control it all the time, we're going to give up that control and we're going to allow matters to flow. Okay? So the principle of what I perceive to be good spiritual practice is avoiding holding on to things, avoiding resisting the situation you're encountering, avoiding trying to constantly control everything. And on the contrary, what I think one should do is try to agree to your circumstances as they are, to allow things to be exactly as they're happening, to give up that control to recognize that whatever's happening is exactly what needs to be happening and to do your best to fit into that situation. So we say we become like water. By becoming like water, you fill whatever container is being offered to you. If it's a teapot, you become a teapot. If it's a kettle, you become a kettle. If it's a glass, you become a glass. Bruce Lee often said this, to become like water. In fact, uh, a wonderful quote from Bruce Lee is, the less effort we make, the faster and more powerful we become. And this, is, in essence, is the, the principle that drives all martial arts practice. A martial artist won't beat you with his fists. In fact, he'll use your energy against you because he knows that your energy has a natural polar position and it's becoming something else. And he anticipates what exactly that energy is becoming and he uses that to his advantage to move you around. But the martial artist won't use force. He won't use effort. He'll be soft. He'll flow. Let you make the movements. He just use your energy against you. So that's the important lesson right there. I'll come back for a moment. So this, in essence, is what energy is. Energy is the natural process of change from one form to its opposite and back again. And by recognizing that, 
we can start to see that everything that we're experiencing in our world ultimately is rather than treating it as some sort of a material object with a bunch of stuff happening what we see it as is simply a conceptual apparatus which is ultimately evolving into some other conceptual apparatus and therefore has what we refer to as an energy gradient and when we can start to understand the texture of the situation by being fully present in that situation we can feel where the energy gradient is, is headed and when we feel where that energy gradient is headed we can surf it like a snowboarder does like a skier does like anybody who understands those kind of sports does or in my case as a martial artist I feel where the energy gradient is going and I flow with it and that's for everything in life so as a martial artist because of my understanding of energy I don't perceive nature as a struggle if you perceive nature as a struggle then you're looking for a fight if you perceive nature for how I perceive it which is that it is a song you're not looking for a fight you're looking for a dance so Tai Chi therefore is what we refer to as the dance of the universe the dance of the polarities and the way you dance with your partner is not by constantly trying to control them not by trying to trip them up it's by feeling where their step is going and moving with them and occasionally when the moment is right and your partner will let you know you take the lead but only for a moment until eventually you give it back to them and they take the lead so this is the idea is that we're going to try to give ourselves to the world and let the world move and as the world moves we move with the world and likewise this is the whole notion of everything that is inside is only a reflection of what's outside so we're starting to get some of the deeper principles right there now the way we come to understand this is trying by, by learning to discover the, the, the moment of change. I'll explain this principle to you. Once more, I'm going to step back and I'm going to show this principle to you. So once more, we're going to talk about the pendulum. Now we notice that the pendulum, as the pendulum swings up, right before the pendulum swings back down again, there's a moment. There's a moment when the pendulum is on its way up to the right before it comes back down to the left and that moment is the moment where form and emptiness are meeting yeah everything in the universe is being generated from that point right there and we refer to that as chi chi is what is ultimately right there that little kind of state between form and emptiness and that chi as we call it is it's a vibration. Now I say it's a vibration because it's not form and it's not emptiness. And if it's neither, then it has to be what? The movement between the two. So when we perceive chi, we normally feel it as a kind of a pulsing. And it's a pulsing between the form, which in this case is my hand, and the emptiness, which of course I can't quite see, because after all, it's emptiness, it's formless. So when I say I feel chi, and somebody says, well, I can't see it. I said, well, of course you can't see it because it's emptiness. Well, then how come you can see it? Because it's my experience of it. Only you can experience chi. So it's very important that people understand what that means. The chi is that fine line, that vibration between form and emptiness. And when we start to move through the polarities and start to flow with them, we start to feel the chi because we're moving as close as possible to that 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 transition between form and emptiness between left and right between black and white between up and down and that's the chi right there that vibration just a little subtle kind of movement between all things so we're going to learn to try to feel chi and the way we're going to do that is through particular exercises okay so I'm going to go through one of those exercises with you right now and I'm going to talk you through a little bit of exercise I perform with if you're in front of a laptop and you want to take a moment to step back and follow me you can you want to practice it another time? That's okay too. It's not a complicated exercise. It's really, really simple. You might go through another one or two exercises afterwards. It might be a little bit, a little bit more full on. But for the moment, at least, we try something really simple to demonstrate this principle. So, what we do is we stand with our legs. And I, can, I know you can't see my legs there, but you can take it for granted. With our legs slightly bent, our knees slightly bent. We just allow our back to just sit into our hips a little bit. We relax our shoulders, we relax our neck, 
relax our entire body, just completely loose. But we bend our knees ever so slightly to get all the support. So we don't stand straight. We just allow ourselves as if we were bored, perhaps. We just relax and frown, perhaps. Okay? So the idea is to try to just be completely relaxed. No resistance. Next thing we're going to do is we're simply going to use mind intention. To take our hands, you can imagine our hands being lifted by our wrists as if somebody was pulling your hand on an invisible string, like a puppet perhaps. We imagine our hands just coming upwards, like so. Okay, I'm going to demonstrate that from the side so it looks like this. And as our hands come up, we're going to imagine that our hands, in fact, are rolling across a wave of water. And as they do that, we're going to imagine the hands curving back over that wave, and eventually as the wave gives way, our hands fall down the other side like so until they come back to our hips nice and relaxed again. So watch that from the side. Looks like this. Hands come up over the wave like curving action, and then they fall back down again like so. So again, up like so, and around, and relax. We'll try and bring our body into that a little bit. As the hands come up, we drop the hips ever so slightly, so it looks like this. We do that by stipping, sticking our buttocks out slightly, so it looks like this. Now when the hands come over the wave and they fall back down again, we're going to push ourselves up slightly at the same time. So what we're doing now is we're allowing the energy to bring our hands up, we're letting the hands drift across the energy, and as we come down the other side, we're going to take those hands and we're going to just push the energy into the ground and it's going to push us up a little bit. So just like so, and over, and down. And up, and over, and down. And we call this exercise rooting. So what we're doing is we're allowing the energy from the ground, which is still, to meet with the movement, which is my hands, and that's going to create the chi. So we've got the stillness, and the movement creating the chi. So as our hands move over the stillness, and then as we push back down again, we're pushing the chi back down into the ground. As we're doing that, the ground is going to resist and push back against our hands. Now as it does that, as we bring our hands over, and we push that into the ground, because the ground is pushing back, it's creating a gradient. Yes, it's creating an energy gradient, which causes my hands to push back up here again. And once more, a little bit of mind intent, a little bit of muscle, just to push that down. And then we're going to let the chi bring my hands up again. So as your hands come up, you can have them feeling very, very light. And as the hands push down, it feels a bit more resistant. So like so. Now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to bring the breathing into that. And the way that, that works is as the hands come up, we're going to breathe in, and as the hands go down, we're going to breathe out. So it becomes a breathing in action like so, and a breathing out action like so. As we do that, we're going to feel the energy building up. We're going to feel that bit of resistance we're going to carry on doing that for a few minutes, not right now, but when you're practicing yourself. You don't have to follow with your breathing. You don't have to move your body up and down. You can just stand still and just move your hands really, really slow. You can let your breathing do whatever it needs to. You don't have to bring the body into it. You can just perform it like that if you like whatever is comfortable. This is a slightly more aggressive kind of a workout when you're doing it like this. It builds up the energy with a bit more of a push to it, but you don't need to do that. You can just start and keep it soft like so. So the most important thing when you're doing this is to be present. So we're going to allow our mind to just focus on the body. That's why I think the breathing is important. When you bring the breathing and the body and the movement all together, in this kind of a 
circular fashion, what you find is that the mind also starts to follow the same pattern. And when something moves in a circle, notice how there's no point in the circle that's faster or slower than anywhere else. The circle is entirely even. And because the circle is even, the mind doesn't get hung up. Yeah? Because the mind is able to jump around, is why it gets hung up. So when we start to move with that kind of a circular action, the mind doesn't get hung up. Because the mind is now flowing from one polarity to its opposite and back again. Okay? So what we're doing right there is we're not just generating energy, we're also starting to move the energy. And we're moving the energy in that notion of what I call flow. And the reason it's moving the way it is is because we're not resisting. When we don't resist, things are happening naturally. Now, as I said, the whole idea of this is that because you are going to be getting more for less, you're actually going to literally end up with excess energy from doing this. Because by simply putting a little bit of intention into it, like so, and carrying on, like so, what you're actually doing is by allowing the polarities to move from one polarity to its opposite and back again, you're actually going to be getting a bit of excess energy. Now, I explained to you earlier on with the pendulum that when you just put a little bit of effort, the polarities themselves will naturally do what they need to do. When you put a little bit of energy into that yourself, as I said, you can see the hand with much less effort goes higher. So that excess energy you're creating is going to be chi you can gather up. So by performing this exercise for a few minutes, maybe some of you are still performing it, I don't know, but when you do, eventually your hands will start to feel quite warm. You start to feel vibrations perhaps in them. You certainly feel them getting warm, a bit of resistance. And when you've done it for long enough, the performance is really strange. You take your hands, hold them down by your hips, and then just, just relax and let your hands come up in front of your center of gravity right here. We call it your dantian. Let your hands come up in front of your body like so, and just gently bring your palms together like so, as if you were holding a ball of energy. And when you do that, and you gently push your hands together, and you just start to feel, you can actually start to feel your hands resisting each other. Yeah? like they're two magnets with the same polarity. Yeah? And what exactly is happening right there is that you've got the form and the emptiness between them and you're pushing. You're pushing the chi, literally. You're pushing that transition zone. And because you're doing that, the form is resisting and it's pushing your hands back outwards again. So you're getting this kind of resistance. And we can use that, that energy we create, to charge our third eye, to charge the throat chakra, to charge the lower chakra, to heal parts of our body and so forth. So it's a really, really amazing tool once you get used to it. Okay, so um, really what I'd like to do maybe now is um, show you another exercise you can do yourselves. I think I've, ex I've outlined as much as I want to outline about energy and what it is and so forth. And um, what I'd like to do now is just maybe go through one more exercise you can use yourselves, and uh, maybe then we can take a little break and come back for some questions and answers. And uh, as I said, I don't want to labor the point here. I think questions and answers is probably a better way to progress from here. So let me show you one more uh, exercise that I think is quite accessible, and um, we can go from there, basically. Okay, so uh, the exercise I'm going to show you, it's a really simple exercise, it's called turning the middle. All we do is we stand, nice and relaxed again, okay, and once more we rely on this idea of just a little bit of mind intent, a little bit of muscular intent just to get things moving, and we're simply going to take our hand and we're going to roll it up like so, completely relaxed, and as we do so the hand's going to come over the top and we're going to let it drop down naturally like so, make sure the camera picks it up. Okay, so it looks like this, 
and comes up. You can see that I'm, my back is straight, my body's straight, I'm nice and relaxed, not tense, and just allowing that to come back down again. Okay, and the hand goes over. And the same thing again. Now notice, I'm not trying to keep any tension here. I'm allowing my stomach to just relax completely. I'm allowing my body to be completely relaxed. I'm not trying to be all stiff about it. On the contrary, what I'm trying to find, and this is the key to what I refer to as the, the essence of the spiritual workout. The spiritual workout is about developing softness. Yeah? Softness is the opposite to rigidity. It's the opposite to how most people experience their world. Most people experience their world as rigid. They're constantly trying to interface the world as something rigid. Simple exercise. If you were to hold your hand up like so, and have somebody take a finger and push your hand as hard as they can. Now, when you resist that, you're going to feel a lot of pain in your hand. If you tell somebody, push your hand like so, and instead of resisting, you simply allow your hand to relax, notice how there's no pain. Yeah? And notice also that if the person decides they want to push your hand as much as they can do, and keep pushing and keep pushing, eventually their hand can't extend any further because it's reached its natural polar dimension and eventually their hand has to give way. In martial arts, we understand this principle. As your opponent comes at you, you can be as soft as you like your opponent. Eventually, his reach can go no further, in which case, boom, we counter. Yeah? But we're not trying to counter him to hurt him and you're not going to try and counter your world to hurt it. The point is that by being soft, we allow for the energy of the opposite to come through. And by doing that, we can literally ride that to whatever experience we want to. So back to our little training technique again. Turning the middle, we watch the hand. It's important when we do this. The reason we watch the hand is to involve the mind. So we allow the hand to come up like so, and we turn the body slightly and drop the hand down again. And the hand like so, turn the body slightly and the hand comes down again. And as we do that once more, we feel a slight kind of an airiness, a lightness to the hand going up. And as it comes down, we feel a little bit of resistance. And you'll feel that naturally in time. And again, that resistance creates the upward gradient of the energy for the hand to go up. And once more, we're going clockwise, we're going clockwise, like so. We're also going to be going from top to bottom. We're going to be going from right to left, left to right, and so on and so forth. Yeah? So allowing that to take place, and back down again. Now also, we're going to follow this with our breathing. So we're going to become soft, like this. So it's a breathe in, and breathe out. And breathe in, and breathe out. Breathe in. Now, as we come to the top, there's a moment where the breath is going to just, this is the breathing in. Before it becomes breathing out, there's a moment of change. We don't breathe there. So we breathe in, and we transition across, and we breathe out. We don't breathe, and we breathe in, and we don't breathe, and we breathe out. And we don't breathe, and we breathe in, and so on. So you'll see the transition zone right there. There's a reason why we keep a little hiatus right there. And when we're doing more elaborate Tai Chi forms, we eventually dissolve that transition zone. But in Qigong, for the moment at least, we're going to keep that transition zone for a reason, because we want to try to separate the polarities. By separating the polarities, we're going to cause them to kind of bounce off each other. When we start to dissolve the polarities together, we have a different kind of effect goes on, so we won't get into that right now. Okay, so um, I think that more or less summarizes what I'm trying to say. Needless to say, if you're going to perform the turning of the mill, if you perform with the right hand, you must also perform with the left hand so as to balance the energies. So if you were to, for example, start by rolling over the wave like so, and then perform the turning of the mill action on both sides, and then take your hands and hold them together, and start to actually feel that energy, you'll feel the chi. And when you do feel the chi, um, I think you'll, you'll, you won't be any doubt as to what exactly is going on. And uh, hopefully what I've said earlier on, therefore, will make a whole lot of sense to you. So finally, I'd just like to say that the, uh, 
what makes uh, a song possible is that each note of music is willing to get out of the way to let the next mo to let the next note of music into play. Yeah, it's because the two notes of music aren't competing with each other that we actually have the melody. Yeah, and everything in nature is happening in the same way. People think that nature is a struggle, that all the various aspects of nature are trying to take something from something else. But really what's going on is what, what is what is present is simply getting out of the way for something else to occur. So this is why we have the cycle of life and death. Death exists in order to precipitate life. And life, needless to say, is part of death and vice versa. So we don't have competition per se. People might try to contradict me and say, tell that to an animal who's the prey on the end of a lion's teeth. But if you think about it, the moment that the lion's teeth actually impact the skin of its prey, just that split second moment, there's a beautiful softness. There's a softness right there. Just before the teeth start to penetrate, there is a moment of softness between the teeth and the body. And that moment of softness is when it hasn't quite entered the skin yet. And it's that softness that is at the essence of everything. It's that softness that precipitates everything. Eventually that becomes the teeth into the body and that becomes a whole event and so forth. But what is precipitating that, that monumental event of the animal being killed by the lion is actually a moment of softness. And that softness exists between form and emptiness. And when we start to move in that softness, when we start to breathe it, when we bring our mind into that softness, and we really start to understand the principles behind that and start to work out to that softness, we develop more softness in our lives. And the more softness we have in our lives, the more, uh, as, as Bruce Lee said, the less effort you make, the faster and more powerful you become. Well, the softer, and I'm perhaps paraphrasing here, the softer you become, the more compassionate you become, and likewise, your experience with other people also becomes far more animate and, and far better all around. Okay, so I think we'll take a break, and uh, I'm going to let Emma pick up where I left off here, and we can do some questions and answers afterwards, and hopefully that's, uh, that's got the idea across. Well, we're not going to have a break, actually, Rory. You're not yeah, that's getting fine. Yeah, I don't need a break. That's cool. You wanna <laughs> You're not getting the hook that easily. But what I'd like you to do, actually, is just now that we've got um, some understanding of, of energy and how it works, how can we then apply that to our lucid dreaming practice? How to maybe understand the fabric of the dream um, and how energy works within a lucid dream? Okay, it's a very good question. So. And again, these are models. Um, we're applying words and models and everything else. So we have a kind of a conundrum at the moment where we talk about mind, body, and spirit. And everybody thinks of the mind as being something you can, and the body is something, and the spirit is something, and they've all sorts of woolly ideas about it. So the way I understand it, as I said, is that everything only exists by virtue of its partner. We won't call it its opposite. We say their partner is like, like a dance. So you have the two people dancing, but you also have the music. Yeah, and that's what creates the universe. So in terms of the dance, the, mu the, the music is the chi. The chi animates everything. The chi is neither form nor emptiness. It's that transition zone between form and emptiness. And to me, what the dream is, is what I call, I, I call this experience the body-mind because primarily we're focused on what we perceive to be our body, which is, which, is, which is precipitating a mind. When we're in the dream state, I call it the mind-body. So we're in a mind that's precipitating a body. So what I would say to people is that you are neither the mind-body, nor are you the body-mind. You are both the body-mind and the mind-body. It's just, it's just where the polarity has shifted. So the polarity in this case has shifted to what we call the physical world is just a polar expression of our consciousness. And likewise, it will shift back into its opposite state in the uh, proverbial dream state. Now, the problem is for most of us, if you think about a pendulum swinging, most of us are good at looking this way. But when the pendulum changes, we get fixated and we can't quite see it going this way. At least when it does, we seem to be going like so. So we keep kind of missing it. We can't follow it. And the reason we can't follow it is because of our mental focus. We get so preoccupied with the idea of being the body that we can't understand that we are, in fact, the mind. And 
therefore, what we need to learn to do is to train our awareness to become more present in, in all of our uh, state and to follow that transition from the body-mind to the mind-body and from the mind-body back to the body-mind. So what the training encompasses basically is learning to use the, uh, the, the, the progression from one polarity to its opposite polarity. By learning to become aware of that progression, we can start to go from waking to dreaming and from dreaming back to waking again. So in, to put that in principle, what one does in order to have a lucid dream with this, with this um, I, I call my, my uh, concept dream tau. And uh, with dream tau, what I try to teach people to do is to, uh, to break up their sleep. And when they do so, they're in the body-mind state. And then by going through a series of exercises, we learn to start to feel the polarities, which eventually will go from the body-mind state to the mind-body state, which is the opposite polarity. But the way we prepare for that transition, which some people call an out-of-body experience or, you know, you could call a lucid dream, the, the vibration zone or, you know, lots of terms for that. Well, that vibration zone is the, is the shift of the polarities, yeah? And, of course, it feels like a vibration because it's neither this nor that, it's both. And it's hard to kind of put your finger on it, so instead of it having a nice smooth swing, it starts to feel quite quick. The polarity is switching quite rapidly. So what we learn to do by getting up in the middle of the night, knowing when the, the natural shift of the tides of consciousness are going to occur, we start to move ourselves into that polar motion. And by doing that, when we go back to bed, we carry that, that notion of the, of the polar shift back in towards the dream state and then when the dream state does come upon us we don't get confused on the contrary we tend to embrace it and recognize the transition from one polar state to its opposite does that answer that wow okay so it's um, the objective is to integrate our waking self with our dreaming self yeah in the same way that you can't have left without right you can't have black without white and you can't have body without mind or mind without body you can't have waking without sleeping and you can't have and the dreaming is the transition zone right there so really what's going on is we're going from waking to sleeping waking to sleeping and dreaming is the transition zone right there and that's why with lucid dreaming we can either, we can be either side of the transition we can be towards the, the the sleeping polarity in which case we dream normally or we can be towards the kind of more waking polarity in which case we can lucid dream so dreaming, in essence, is the transition zone of the two polarities. And uh, therefore, by learning to feel the shift of the polarities and becoming more aware of it, uh, we find that transition is a little less foreign to us, in which case we can bring our attention into the proverbial lucid dream state. Excellent. Um, I've got one question for, from Morticia, who is just has a uh, clarification question about one of the exercises you did. She says, after the wave exercise, do you put the collected chi into the dantian or physically into the identified part of the physical body that needs healing or do you use your thoughts to direct the chi to the part of the body that needs healing after putting the chi into the dantian? Yeah, um, well, typically speaking, what, what I'll do is, um, depending on what the exercise is, I'll, I'll normally just bring the chi to the various chakras and just try and keep an overall balanced energy really and then just allow the body to decide where things want to go after that but I do know that on, a, on another level th there is such a thing as people healing particular parts of the body or they might bring it to a certain part of the body and then move it through the body to another part of the body and so forth it, it, again it will kind of depend on the practitioner and their choice for me I normally just uh, focus on the, on the five chakras I say five, six, whatever, I don't know, I don't count them, I go through the chakras um, and I just bring the energy to them individually and uh, on, unless I'm lucid dreaming specifically in which case it's normally the third eye I bring it to and then I move the energy uh, with, I move the energy internally from the uh, third eye to the crown chakra and back again and I create a kind of a vibration effect right there and I try to hold that when I get back to bed um, but that's an exception that's specifically for lucid dreaming. Okay, that sounds really interesting. I think we've got um, time for one last question from uh, Vanessa, because um, we're coming up to the hour mark. And she um, wants to know how you um, 
basically great spirit is also a form of energy. So how do you explain the concept of great spirit within your concept of uh, energy? Now, great spirit, I'm not sure what one means by great spirit. Perhaps clarify the question. Um, I think great spirit meaning like um, the oneness, the the oneness of everything. Yeah, okay, yeah. So the idea of that is that the way I look at that is when are left and right opposite but equal at the same time? And the answer is a circle because in a circle you can have left and right but they're also the same thing because ultimately they're creating each other. And the, the point is that everything is creating everything else. Nothing is independent. You can't have a single aspect of the universe isolated by itself. It only exists by virtue of everything else. You can only have, for example, uh, left and right. They create each other. But you can't have left and right without up and down because that doesn't make any sense. And you can't have up and down and left and right without somebody there to distinguish them, in which case you have to have me. And I am what they are not, and so on and so forth. So there's nothing in the universe that you can actually take with a tweezers and pull out and say, yeah, well, that kind of stands out by itself. Even the tweezers itself ultimately is part of everything else. A tweezers is, is what a frog is not. A frog is what a knife is not, and so forth. Everything is only a conceptual contrast of everything that it's not, and therefore everything is one. And what is one is all interconnected. So what we call the great spirit, um, and this is a kind of a common concern for people, is that we conceptually see the world as either or, this or that, left or right, black or white, and therefore we think that things are either something or they're one thing, but they can't be both things. And that really is uh, a point that I think that gets raised a lot and, and mishandled by people when they say that you can't talk about it, you can only allude to it, it's the non-conceptual, non-dualistic, and there's a whole debate goes on right there. But I'm going to maybe make a shout at somebody right here. There's somebody speaking at the Gateways Conference uh, in Ireland in uh, June. Uh, Tim Freak is his name. And uh, he's written an amazing essay on that called The, uh, the Mystery Experience. If you're not going to come and see him in Ireland, then I recommend seeing him. But if you're not going to come and see him in Ireland, uh, I recommend reading The Mystery Experience. Uh, he has taken this idea of non-duality and he has... He has married it to the dualistic experience and shown you that ultimately they can both coexist and they do coexist um, in the same way that emptiness um, is precisely what creates form and form creates emptiness. Um, you know, it, it is just something that we get a bit stuck in our language with sometimes, but Tim Freaks talks about uh, moving away from paradox, what he calls paralogical language. And I think that's something that's kind of really going to come in and, and certainly, if I had more time to, um, to explain it to you, what I'm teaching, um, very much what I'm doing is a combination of moving from polarity to polarity and also moving through circles. Yeah? Well, you'll notice when I move through the circles, I'm also meeting the polarity points as well. So I can move like so, from polarity to polarity, or I can move in a circular fashion. This is what I was alluding to earlier on when I was doing the uh, turning of the mill and I said we stop and we, we, we pose the breath and we move down, we pose the breath and move down. But I said sometimes we move in a circle and the breath doesn't pause. In other words, the in-breath and the out-breath eventually dissolve into each other. The movement dissolves into the next movement and so on. And that's when we become one. Um, and, and that's slightly more advanced practice and I didn't really want to get into that today. But it, it's certainly, um, much as I can allude to right there, the way I would say it in summary again is uh, when are left and right opposite but equal at the same time and the answer is a circle and uh, therefore the opposites are in fact although individual they're also inseparable they're also unidentifiable you can't identify left and right in a circle where do you start? The great paradox <laughs> Yeah, okay. like say, listen to Tim, Tim Freaks he moves away from paradox to paralogical and I think he does a really really good job so I you know, don't don't be intimidated by paradox. It's too free. Got a good answer there. Okay. Well, we have gone past slightly past the hour mark, so the um, webinar is officially coming to an end. However, um, if people want to stay on and if uh, for an extra ten minutes, and Rory, if you've got an extra ten minutes, I've got so yeah, many yeah. questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, not problem at all. 
So um, everybody will receive a link to the webinar um, afterwards um, so that you can re-watch this um, again. And I know a couple of you um, actually lost your connection, so you can re-watch the, the bits you, that you missed. Um, but if you'd like to stay online and listen to us, for to Rory, for another 10 minutes, I can um, field a couple more of your questions to him. So um, there's a question from Donald who says... Um, you have been talking about energy moving between poles and through this process forms become the opposite and then back again and so forth so left becomes right etc but what about newness and creativity how do new forms come into being in this process yeah that's a very good question again so ultimately what we have in essence as I said is we have emptiness emptiness means that all form is possible because it's empty it is non-finite and therefore what can be precipitated from emptiness is infinite. What we are therefore perceiving is the interplay of the polarities is the expression I use. So if for example you had a sheet of glass and it was a square and I said to you what form can you see there? You say I can only see a square. I say okay now I take a hammer and I smash the glass and there are a variety of interplays there of of, of, of activities and what is precipitated therefore a whole lot of new shapes. So if you were to break down fundamentally what I was doing right there, you could reduce that to a number of polaric principles being um, employed in order for me to take a hammer and smash the glass. But what's being precipitated from those, um, from those, those, those polar motifs um, are, are new apparati. A, a good example of explaining this would be uh, the, the pendulum once more and I'll show this to you. So with, with the pendulum, um, what I'm doing is I have stillness and I have what we'll call right and left and up and down. So if I allow this to drop from stillness to movement, from right to left and from up to down, right? what I'm actually doing is I'm actually inadvertently creating a third property, which is clockwise, which eventually becomes anti-clockwise. So the, if you take up and down and left and right and stillness and movement and you put them all together you create clockwise yeah so you've kind of created another property right there and therefore in essence everything you're doing is creating other properties all the time and we're constantly discovering those properties and in doing so we are developing the world around us and this is how we say we're discovering energy for example the internet is a, a property of nature that potentially exists until we discover it, in which case we do, we release it, we release the energy of it. And uh, therefore, um, energy, as I said, is merely the interplay of concepts. So you could say that energy really is uh, it's a concept and that the world, therefore, is made of concepts. And those concepts are interacting and interplaying with each other to develop other concepts and so on and so forth. Um, so us being here tonight, for example, we are conceptually... Uh, developing this idea and so on. Which brings us nicely onto the next question from Craig who says, do you think it's a bad idea to try to create your reality by manifestation or, or similar and that you should try to just go with the flow? I, that's, probably the, that's, that's probably the most fundamental question anybody could ask me, um, which is that I think the biggest mistake we've, we've made uh, in terms of our understanding of nature is that we have come to the conclusion that nature is a struggle uh, where only the fittest survive and therefore we should compete with each other and we should compete with the planet and we should do our best to use this law of attraction to bring whatever I want into my world because after all it's all about me. Um, I think that's exactly what I'm telling you doesn't work what I'm saying does work is to be like the surfer. The surfer harnesses the movement of the wave in order to have the experience of, of the surf. Um, he never tries to control the wave. On the contrary, he just asks, where are the best waves? Where is the wave heading? Where would I best be suited with that wave? And really, what Dream Tao, Tai Chi, Taoist philosophy and the likes are ultimately all about is about giving up uh, the sense of me having to have things my way because 
if you are trying to get things your way, if you're trying to manifest your reality, which is this common term people are, are, are very attached to these days, the idea of law of attraction, precipitate this idea of trying to manifest your reality, trying to push your reality, trying to dream it into existence and so on. Um, what you'll find is that whatever's happening to you, you're resisting. And it's like this finger in the palm of the hand thing again. You're resisting, and you're pushing against what's happening, and you're getting a very, very sore hand in the process. Instead, what you should do is treat the world as a part of you. This is the inner, and that's the outer. And they're the polarities, and they're playing with each other. Yeah, You're creating the world, and it's creating you. And like a dance partner, you've got to feel its rhythm. It's not a fight. It's a dance. So when I teach people Tai Chi, I say I'm going to teach you the dance of the universe. And the dance of the universe is polarity. And polarity means feeling. It means feeling where things are flowing and then going with it. And when it flows into something else, you flow with that too. Maybe a little to the left, maybe a little to the right to try to you know, steer things your way too. You can't have your dance partner moving around the floor and you standing still. At the same time, sometimes you take the lead, sometimes they take the lead. But what's important is that you need to know where the rhythm is, where the music is. And that's the problem people, miss, the problem people make, is that they're constantly, constantly trying to control their world. And uh, in trying to control your world, ultimately, you end up with the world smacking you about. But when you start to give up that control and really, really, really engage that philosophy of giving up the control, uh, like you're breathing, you don't hold your breath, you don't try and control your breath. In fact, it's a good exercise is to try to control your breath and see how uncomfortable it is. But it's because you don't try to control your breath that it feels as fluid as it does. As soon as you become conscious of your breath and really try to control your breath, it starts to feel very uncomfortable. So just try it sometime. It's a great example. Okay. Um, now, Linda um, is referring to the exercise that you did when you put your hands together and um, to feel the chi between your hands. And she said, uh, um, could that not be just an illusion of expectation of feeling the opposite hand? Yeah, well, I mean, isn't all reality just an illusion of expectation or something? <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, I don't think we should draw those kind of, I hate to use this term, kind of narrow conclusions about our world um, in that we don't really uh, understand uh, what it means to say that, uh, that we can feel something necessarily. Uh, when one feels the energy vibrations, uh, as I said, the problem with this in terms of measuring it is that you can't apply a measuring quality to it because that measuring quality would imply that some, somebody else, the idea being, of course, as I said, is that you have the inner, which is the inner world, and the outer world, and the transition zone. That's exclusive to you. You can't have somebody else measure that for you because they're not part of your inner world. Yeah? So, this, as I say, creates a kind of a qualitative conundrum in terms of bringing measuring apparatus. You've got somebody gibbering on here to you saying, man, I can feel energy. It's crazy. And it's like this, like a ball of energy in my hands. Can't you see it? And everybody else is like, no. And I said, well, maybe if we got it under some sort of an imaging device and we can show it to the scientists and they can measure it. And the scientists are looking down saying, no, we can't see it either. So this guy must be talking crazy. And thousands of years of practice, these guys passing on Tai Chi from generation to generation are saying, yeah, but there's nothing there. I guess the obvious answer is, when you're dreaming, you can pick something up and you can hold it in your hands. You can eat it, you can sit on it, you can punch it, you can taste it, you can pull your hair in a dream and feel it. But apparently there's nothing there. What does that mean? You know, what is there ultimately is what you experience. And when we try to draw hard lines about what is measurable and therefore real, and what is not measurable and therefore not real, then we think that the world is made of form only, and we're ignoring the emptiness. We don't understand the principle of emptiness. We fundamentally don't grip the notion of emptiness in the Western world, and that's the problem. We don't understand that ultimately the same emptiness that gives the glass the property to hold the water is the same emptiness that holds the entire universe. But all we can see is the universe. And it's precisely because of that that we can't see the fact that we're waking to sleep and we sleep to wake. We live to die and we die to live. And somewhere in the middle, there's a clue. And the clue is the dream. And when we get into the dream, 
we start to see that the inner world is just as real as the outer world. And when we start to explore that concept a little bit more, we start to accept things like chi, for example. It becomes a little more tangible to us. So I guess I can't give you chi in a glass because chi is only ever experienced by the transition between the inner and the outer world. So it's, it's, a, it's an obvious kind of uh, concern for people, as I said, and one that will no doubt either be in some cases the making of the person's experience because they'll discover it and feel it for themselves or in other people's cases um, it will be an unmeasurable quantity to their contextual view of reality in which case much like lucid dreaming it will only ever be something they hear about and never actually experience. Thank you Rory and I think we're gonna have to leave it there but thank you for such amazing wisdom that you've shared with us this evening. Um, perfect for our first Wisdom Hub uh, webinar. So um, thanks to everybody who's joined us as well. Um, like I said I'll be sending out links tomorrow so that everybody can re-watch it at your own leisure. Um, and sorry about I think there was a few technical issues at the beginning. We are Mercury retrograde so uh, um, to be expected a little bit. <laughs> um, but thank you so much, Rory, for your time. It's been oh, like, and thanks really Rory for coming fun. online. Much appreciated and much appreciate the questions as well. And um, appreciate everything. And pardon me is a, a cat meowing in the background. They're getting anxious my cats are. <laughs> Great. Okay, so the uh, webinar is officially uh, finished. So thank you everybody and um, nice. have a great evening. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>